I'm Jerry. Kim, I've known you for a long time. Why don't you give us a little background on uh, what you're doing these days re regarding uh, the pursuit of happiness and, and ramifications as to the meaning of life and whatever role. Okay. Death well, um, I'm, I'm involved in a nonprofit uh, project that was initiated in 2005. Um, to create educational materials on uh, on the promotion of psychological well-being and depression prevention uh, based on life skills. So it, it involves a, a sort of intriguing blend of psychology and philosophy. Is your PhD in philosophy? Uh, my PhD is in actually intellectual history. But your undergraduate, well, which, your undergraduate work was in... My undergraduate work was in education. My, my BA was in education. My MA was in Confucian philosophy. And my PhD, my DPhil, um, was in intellectual history of, of East Asia. And you taught oh, yeah. at Oxford and Berkeley and a few other uh, reputable places. Yeah, I taught. I taught. I was a junior lecturer in Oxford, um, and um, yeah, I was a, a visiting scholar in Berkeley. I taught at Stony Brook for State University of New York at Stony Brook for uh, eight, uh, eight years, and at the University of Bridgeport for how many years? I don't even want to remember. <laughs> so. Um... In, in the pursuit of happiness, and 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 and, and I, I guess there's a, a connection between the pursuit of happiness and this notion of the meaning of life. Yeah, absolutely. I I kind of, in some ways, you know, originally our nonprofit organization was was named, you know, the Pursuit of Happiness Project, um, because when we first founded it, I assumed that America that you know that the the uh, citizens of the United States were well aware of the original meaning of Tom Jefferson's expression, the pursuit of happiness. But to my chagrin, discovered that uh, they had deeply misinterpreted Tom Jefferson uh, and thought that the pursuit of happiness meant the pursuit of wealth uh, and property, which is how John Locke originally interpreted it. But uh, if you look at Tom Jefferson's correspondence, he very clearly did not think that was what the pursuit of happiness was. He 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 uh, was a huge fan of Epicurus, and he thought the pursuit of happiness was actually very very similar in some ways to what uh, Buddha thought about human about well being. Yeah, so um, why is everybody unhappy then? It's not the prospect of death clearly because you want, you want my opinion or tom jefferson's or epicurus's opinion <laughs> well well uh, uh that and then also just uh, uh in contemporary terms um there's uh, i i've heard this observation that um we're not aware of our mortality until we turn 40. and then yeah well that's death, different that so, becomes a more looming uh, constraint and uh in yeah, that's that's not a topic. That's not a topic. I'm I'm. I kind of I'm confident in talking about. Mm -hmm. Although many of the philosophers I studied have spoken about it, I'm much more confident to talk about purpose in life, meaning in life, etc. Well, let's focus on that then. Okay. So um, uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, interest recently. In the realm of well-being, uh, put, uh, um, specifically on the topic of finding meaning in life, and so uh, the the reason why meaning in life is particularly an interesting topic for me now is that it's become a focus of research um, as psychologists and psychiatrists are now uh, are coming to, are converging. Uh, there's sort of a convergence, uh, a consensus that uh, one of the core components of well-being is is uh, is the discovery of meaning. So, oh, Viktor Frankl has now recently picked up a lot of uh, support 
in uh, neuroscience and psychology. Now, now, so now here's a question because I've read Frankel's uh, book. In fact, I happen to have it right here, uh, and um, and I, I give this out to the Oxford people as well because I find yeah. a lot of people in 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 recovery. Um, one of the issues they're grappling with is the meaning of life. Uh, yeah. But, you know, my criticism of that book is that, uh, well, Frankel, uh, to Frankel, fulfillment is finding meaning. And to uh, Al uh, Al uh, Alder, the, you know, the three, the, 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 Vien the three guys in the Viennese school of uh, psychology, uh, to Alder, it's, it's the uh, uh, pursuit of control and power. And yeah. to Freud, it's uh, it's the pursuit of uh, pleasure. Cocaine. There you go. Uh, 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 so so here's the um, you, you know he, th this is the epiphany that I had fairly recently. Um, well, you know, as an academic, that ha this has a lot of appeal to us because we're professors and. Uh, meaning understanding knowledge yeah, that's the kind of stuff that resonates with us yeah but um you know I, I volunteered a senior center near here and everybody shows up for a free lunch and uh and uh you know, to play pinochle and bingo and uh share uh pictures of the grandchildren and they don't seem to have any uh high level uh uh needs in their life there's no real high order higher order uh, uh needs it's all sort of b needs stuff and a focus on the present and just uh living for another day and maybe to see another sunrise well it's interesting because you know that immediately brings to mind uh maslow's hierarchy of needs but you know the, the fascinating thing is is that some of the most deeply inspiring psychological insights are not really based on on scientific data. You know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was that based on a you know some uh, was that data based? No, it wasn't. It was based on a lifetime of research, but it was very intuitive. Um, um, well, those are the, the sorts of things I refer to as useful fictions. And uh, um, I wouldn't take such a skeptical view as you. I would say that um, it's it's not science based, but that doesn't mean that it's fictional. It means that it's a hypothesis. Um, and it's it's a hypothesis that we cannot actually prove, but um, it answers a lot of questions. And to that extent, it's a very um, it's it's not only fascinating, but it's a uh, it's a convincing hypothesis. Right, like the standard model in uh, quantum physics. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure I can respond to that. All I can tell you is that quantum physics is way more data-based than Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. You, it, you know, it, you know, one of the arguments I have to people who have that quantitative uh, 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 framework uh, uh, is that, uh, you know, after I'm 65 years old and I've seen, en I've had, I've got enough incidental anecdotal experience to be able to see some trends and um, even interviewing people for, for my uh, re recovery program, I could just talk to somebody and I've got very highly evolved bullshit filters and you can just tell whether it's going to work for them or not or where they're going to end up six months down the road yeah. just on the basis of the responses. And, yeah and 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 i get, there's no database on that it's just experience yeah, you're, you're, exactly you're immediately using your inductive your your powers of induction not deduction right mm -hmm. and and um i i think uh and this is why i think uh, karl popper made a huge mistake when he called the scientific method 
the uh what was it he called it the uh the analytical deductive method um so so uh, popper uh, popper completely dis yes and in in the process his theory of falsification well it's great and i think his theory of falsification was brilliant but uh when he claimed that induction had no role in in uh in scientific discovery i think he was talking through his you know what mm -hmm. uh scientific discovery if you if one has even the faintest idea of how uh scientists you know come to uh discover things it 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 involves a very complex interplay between induction and deduction you need induction to make the hypothesis and you need deduction in order to disprove or prove it yeah but anyway but when, it, it, sort of, incidentally you know yeah. the resolution of that in my mind and and i have uh, objective knowledge right here as a matter of fact and um um you know i, I my take on it was that you come up with a hypothesis and, and then you you come up with a model and it has to be testable so it's not a question of whether or not it's true it's what is it testable and I think that that opens the door to uh, deduction and induction and 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 empirical empirical uh, uh, evidence. Or, or well, then, then, then let me challenge you with a question. Then Maslow's hierarchy is not testable. It's not testable. You call it a fiction, but I call it a very useful hypothesis because um, it answers a lot of questions. Um, and it, it it it's very useful in terms of practice well you know um, i agree and, and you're familiar with my my uh framework for living you know my yeah. morning ablutions and then um uh bee needs anything before breakfast is a bee need and and uh, from my uh perspective and then uh executing the day uh, am I good at what I'm doing? Is it giving me a sense of purpose? Is it, uh, am I passionate about it? And is it making the world a better place? Maybe I could call those right. the four Bs. Yeah. Now that works for me. And, uh, and I have a, a fairly rigid uh, uh, schedule, uh, at least through the mid morning. And, uh, you know, as they say, you used to be able to set your watch by the, uh, when Kant, uh, 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 set off in the morning. Um, so, uh, I'm somewhat a creature of habit and that's work works for me. And, and I've, I've gotten to the point now where I got my routine down. Um, and I'm fairly content. Why are people unhappy? Why are people, uh, uh, devoid of a sense of meaning in their lives? Yeah. So, uh, so again, um you know unhappiness has so many sources the so it's like socrates said right the more you the more you know the more you realize you don't know uh, to, to, to sort of rephrase socrates right mm -hmm. it's uh the deeper you go into quantum physics the the more like science fiction it seems um so it's the same with happiness the the, the more research you do on the causes of unhappiness the more you realize how complex the issue is and the more you realize that there's a lot of variables and and that's why i think we're failing to solve the problem the psych this you know that the uh psychologists seem to think it's it's psychosocial um but i think it's it's way more than that it's it's a combination uh so for example you know it it, it it's um it's about it's like physical well-being right physical well-being requires it's a it's a homeostasis that requires uh you know a lot of things to go well like vitamins and phytochemicals and sunlight and and nutrients and 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 uh happiness too um your my, your microbiome nutrition sleep uh relationships uh peak experiences you know and and so it's it's not it's it's complex but you know it just it, going back to maslow's uh uh hierarchy i go to the senior center and 
I don't think these people have any uh, higher felt needs. I think they're there for a free lunch and, and some socialization. And uh, it gives them something to do between uh, uh, breakfast and uh, nap time. Yeah, well, then there's the big mystery, right? Why do so many people, why are still, so many people still hunting after bright, shiny things after living, you know, 70 years? Did Haven't they got it? You know, haven't they, you know, why do so many people seem to, um, you know, uh, fail to realize that, um, You'll you'll never be satisfied by shiny objects, right? Well, the novelty uh, the, effect it wears off, but uh, it gets them through the uh, morning hours. I I I personally think it's because we've been brainwashed by uh, a lot of it is because we've been brainwashed by the media to 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 look for shiny objects, and and it's uh, you know it's very difficult to uh, to to be deprogrammed, right? Uh, even though we might intellectually know that um, the the higher needs bring us greater happiness, you know, in other words, no. Even though we may sort of intellectually know that, uh, you know, from the point from Maslow's point of view, that that happiness is 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 uh, much more than you know the physiological and the uh, um, and the uh, you know the self-esteem needs. Uh, we 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 know that it's more than that. We know that meaning is very important, but but you know why don't we actually implement it? And it's I think it's habits, right? We've been we're stuck with the habits that we've been um, brainwashed, not brainwashed, but uh, uh, um, how would you say that socialized. Uh, and it very it's not easy to break away so it's a form of social reproduction I guess so yeah we've been we've been socialized to um, to to behave in ways that satisfy the, uh, the 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 bottom two three or four levels of Maslow's hierarchy and intellectually we know that that's not the solution but we find it very difficult to escape from those from those sort of habits that we follow, I guess. Now, so why are kids unhappy today? Do you think kids are more unhappy than they were 50 years ago? Well, it, well, again, you see, it's a very complex problem. I, uh, I, I actually personally, I think that Chinese kids are deeply unhappy. The, the depression rate in China is is so high that they they that I I've heard that they. Uh, um they provide you know false data um but um talking to kids in china you get the feeling that the main cause of unhappiness is um is self-efficacy a lack of self-efficacy they don't feel they feel that they've lost control of their lives or they feel that they haven't had control of their lives ever mm. because of the because they're they're being controlled by their parents uh by their government um uh, you know to a very large extent they're not able to set their own goals and to follow their goals whereas you take your average american kid you've got very high self-efficacy you, you've got um relatively a, a high amount of self-efficacy the ability to choose their own goals uh, but you may say that they choose goals that are you know that are harmful to their well-being right so it's a complex would situation east, would you say east and west that uh, one of the causal factors of that is the rise of social media and technology and isolation yeah absolutely i think a, a common cause of unhappiness is absolutely um the uh the the rise of um of, of isolation due to misuse of of social media and the web and i i call it uh what is it i call it uh, oxytocin deficiency we don't you know there's right now you and me 
Um, I think we're, at, we're, you know, there, there are various levels of interpersonal communication, right? And I think we're somewhere in between texting on social media and talking face to face. Do you think maybe that, we're generating? A, yeah, go ahead. Well, I'm just wondering, you know, you, you know, I always, I, I do a, a unit on um, virtual reality, and I show yeah. how there are parallels in the evolution of uh, of uh, virtual reality to uh, the rediscovery of the third dimension in Renaissance art. You know, in Byzantine, I was two dimensional, and then we rediscovered the third dimension and perspective. Um, in, in life. Yeah, I, I just think that the the meta the metaverse will never, no matter how sophisticated the metaverse gets, it will never get us there. You don't because... think that when we have matrix uh, level uh, uh, virtual immersive virtual reality, where we put in goggles and you and I feel like we're in the same pub, we'll never that get we there. We won't get the and same I'll... sense of fulfillment. I'll give you one, just one example of why it'll never get us there, because of uh two things um we, we only get oxytocin from actually touching people from hugging people and we, we're not even sure how that's generated but it's the physical contact and also pheromones smell seem to play a very uh, much more significant role than we thought they played in um in what we derive from face-to-face -face contact now what if that was addressed technologically if I could send you pher pher pheromones. Yeah, if they uh, had a spritz uh, dispenser. I think, I think, you know, from the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, we always thought we knew better than nature. And uh, I think that's the arrogance of humans, that we'll never get there. Because um, contact with, we, we can never reproduce uh, nature. But with the move from on-site to online education, do you think that that's going to have a corrosive effect on learning? Um, I mean, if if it's if it's a if it's so, that's the thing. Um, no, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think about it simplistically like that. I, I think, I think that, a, a, a lot of kids are socialized by having to go to school, and now that's uh, less, yeah. less of an option. So I think, um, you know, again, it's a question of balance, right? We need to supplement our, our virtual communication with a certain amount of skinship. So if, for example, we're in the middle of a very serious ac epidemic and if it was Ebola or something and I could never actually talk, to, you know, meet people outside, uh, then, you know, I would hug trees and, and talk to animals. Uh, which I do anyway. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, I think, it, yeah, it's a question of, of, um, it's not a black and white issue. Mm. I think it, it's a question of balance, isn't it? You see, I have to tell you, I mean, I've lost a lot of uh, my uh, friends. I, a lot of my academic friends, by the way, they're dying of Parkinson's or Alzheimer's to a person. And uh, I've even had some memory uh, recall latency issues that I've dealt with as a consequence of some medication I was on. It's clearing up because they changed my prescription. But yeah. um, it, I'm wondering, I mean, do you, do you think people get happier as they get older? Well, the statistics clearly, uh, from what I clearly indicate, Ed Dina did work on this. And, um, and so did... Um, Ah, what's his name? Anyway, a lot of work has been done on this, and we have actually pretty clear stats um, that indicate we get happier as we get older uh, until, you know, of course, things start falling apart rapidly. Yeah, um, and, and do you think it's diet-related as well? That's a good question. Uh, we get, uh, I mean, for some of us, some of us get a little wiser. Um, we, we learn, we learn more about ourselves. We learn more about relationships, I guess. Are kids more um, depressed because they eat more junk food and candy? 
Yeah, I I think that's an actually a very interesting theory, that that we that we we learn from experience what kind of foods lead to our well being Intu intuitively, uh, if if not scientifically, because there's a lot of scientific information now coming out about what what's good or bad for us. But intuitively, I think as we get older, we know, uh, you know, so for example. If if I drink, uh, I I love cocoa with lots of sugar in it, but after a few months of drinking cocoa with sugar in it, I feel crappy. Um, it feels very good, tastes like a drug, mm -hmm. but it takes a lot of it takes a lot of cups of cocoa, and and took me many years to discover that. Um, you know, yeah. So I think that's a that's a very valid uh, insight. Yeah. The other observation I've uh, I've uh, seen because uh, as you may or may know, my friend Bob died a few weeks ago, and my friend yeah. Kurt has Parkinson's as well. A lot of the same symptoms. Uh, you know, I sit with him. His wife uses it as a respite to go shopping for five hours, because uh, I mean she has to help him just to get out of out of his out of bed and into a chair barely get three words out of the guy, except if we talk about uh, things in the past, then he can, he, uh, he seems to have that encoded and he can talk about that, but anything novel, that's, that facility is yeah. gone. But I see that as people get older and they're facing their uh, ultimate demise, they get depressed. So there's an uh epic. Uh, well, that that's been the preconception. That's been a preconception, but according to the data, we don't. According to the data, we actually get happier, and and we 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 look at our teenage years through rosy glasses. But actually, uh, it 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 appears that uh, that that is indeed what happened. That we look at the teenage years with rosy glasses, and we intellectually imagine that getting older you know well as we get closer to fra greater frailty and disease we get more unhappy but that's not the case you know it's funny i took a writing course with philip roth uh in new york back in the 80s and then just yeah. coincidentally i ran into him and his stepdaughter at the uh, at the boulders cafe at lake warmog and uh we were there for the fireworks display, but the mosquitoes were out, so everybody ran inside. And Phil and I took the little citronella candles and we arranged them around the railing and the table so that we had like a uh, citronella barrier. And we're yeah. watching the fireworks over, over uh, Lake Warmug, and um, you know he remembered me, uh, and and I said, look, I I yeah, all these people are are the paparazzi are always out to get his opinion or his uh, autograph on a nap. Yeah. I just treated yeah. him like a regular guy. And I said, uh, you know, I'm just curious, you're getting older. Do you think about death? And yeah. he said, uh, uh, daily, no. Weekly, yes, but daily, no. <laughs> so, um, uh, but, you know, I'm finding as I get older, I do think about it and I find it, it's, it's a constraint and that there are things I need to get done and uh, I want to make sure everything's checked off of my uh, bucket list. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, um, uh, I, I guess what I've learned from Chinese philosophy and maybe a certain amount from Indian philosophy is um, the ability to, the importance of um, uh, enjoying the moment. Um, and in a way, you could say that's scientific. The future and the past don't really exist. They're just uh, con constructions. Mm. Um, it'd be nice if it, if it looped, at least, and I could uh, correct my mistakes. <laughs> um, well, you know, Jeff Bezos talks about his regret minimization matrix. He's got a list of things that he wants to do, and he takes chances so that at least he could say, I tried. And I remember Oprah Winfrey's catechism that uh, probably quoting uh, how the, half a dozen other people that have been this has been attributed to that um, uh, nobody on their deathbed ever regretted uh, spending more time in the office. 
but is there is there any data on people uh, in in their final moments confronting the issue of having uh, uh, not accomplished everything that they set out to do or having regrets or is there a, a, a more statistically more of a sense of resignation? Well, there's been some very interesting research by the head of psychiatry at Sloan Kettering University Hospital. Sloan Kettering. Um, What's his name now? Um, and um, he actually has done research um, specifically with people that, you know, were about to, that were in the middle of an existential crisis, right? Because of the nature of the disease. Mm. They, they, were, they were facing their demise within a period of days or weeks or months. And he discovered, um, and he was influenced by, by Viktor Frankl, but what he did is he took Viktor Frankl's uh, logotherapy and he applied it to um, uh, uh, the, the, the therapy of um, existentially challenged cancer patients. And he found that if they were asked to uh, retrace their life and think about the most meaningful moments in their life, and about what gave their life meaning, um, that they immediately found they they found enormous relief, most of them, and their outcomes were actually much better. It sounds like a creative anachronism. Why? Well, uh, reenacting the past in order to construct a, uh, a framework for uh, well, living. Well, they weren't asked to reenact the past as much as to from a more positive angle, think about the meaningful things that they had achieved or the meaning or, or to look for meaning in, in their lives. So basically it's a sort of, right, you're, 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 you're purposefully focusing on what of your life was meaningful rather than what was meaningless. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I've also observed by uh, from sitting with people in hospice, my parents and, and a couple of uh, good yeah. friends up to the the very end, was that um, one way to get them out of their depression is to, is to give them the distraction of replaying something pleasant in the past or recounting an event. And... Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I found with my uh, father... You know, he would, I, in fact, I remember my father was in a lot of pain. You know, he had gangrene from the knees down. I mean, if he could get up and was cognizant of the fact that his legs were black from the knees, knees down, um, he'd faint. But um, if I got him to talk about the past uh, or I replayed something that he told me, it was a distraction and he, uh, his, uh, his discomfort, uh, went away yeah it's interesting so i don't know if i've answered your question but um <laughs> i don't even know what the question is exactly but anyway well death and the meaning of life and uh, to me it's not so much i i think to 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 look for meaning in life is just uh one formula uh, I don't think it's one right, size well, fits all. I think it's one size fits one. For some people, I think uh, people seek fulfillment, and fulfillment can be just uh, talking to the grandchildren and having lunch and playing bingo. And uh, other people, it's uh, scholarly pursuits. But I don't think we should define uh, meaning to the level that Frankel. Uh, uh, it, se it seems to be the universal panacea for him. Well, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I have to, I, I should say that, yeah, we, we, I was clear that, you know, before we, we began this conversation, I already told you that, you know, I prefer to focus on, on, on meaning as that's the area I'm much more familiar with. Um, but, oh, are you still there? Oh, oh yeah. okay. Yeah. That internet um, for a second there. Yeah. I mean, just to sort of tie things up. Um, I, I, I actually am a little bit frustrated by Frankel because 
the book is very moving. Man's Search for Meaning is a very moving book, and Logotherapy is um, very well reasoned. But um, he sometimes kind of, I find him a little bit evasive in terms of, well, what meaning did he personally find that got him through the prison camp? Because at some point, it, it seems as if he, he derived the greatest meaning from wanting to get out so that he could tell other people his story. I thought, it was to, point, I thought it was to be reunited with his wife. Exactly. And, and I was just about to say that. And the second one was the idea of the hope that he would be reunited with his wife. So mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's two different uh, um, angles he takes. Um, but... Um, be the hope that he'll be reunited with his wife. I don't find very convincing myself. You know, it's like okay. Um, so did most of the people in the prison camp. Mm. Um, they wanted to be, you know, reunited very badly with their relatives. I personally think that what got him through it was the deep desire to tell his story um, and enrich the lives of others through that insight. So there you go. You know, uh, when I sit with these uh, octogenarians at the senior center, they don't seem to have a uh, 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 hankering to leave an intellectual legacy or uh, any uh, uh, lessons from the past. And you know, it was even more striking to me because whenever, whenever Janet and I fly to Europe, we always make a pit stop in Iceland because we like to do the free three day over, you know, the, the free layover, three day layover. And uh, uh, there's a little a cemetery up there with graves from the 16, 17 and 1800s. And I'm thinking, God, you know, these couples have been uh, underground for 200 years. And uh, you can only walk around here maybe a month or two a year and uh they're just names on a headstone what legacy have they left i yeah well well we we don't know right we don't know it might not be might not be written um all i know is that um the power of self-reflection is extremely important and i think our educational system has failed to sort of in imbibe students with that power um and I, I think there's a reason why Socrates, you know, is regarded as one of the fathers of modern education because that that was one of his right main focuses to 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 um, you know to tell his students um, that the, the the greatest power they the, the the greatest gift they could have is the power to 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 reflect on themselves. Um, as well as um, ask difficult questions, right? There was kind of two sides of the coin. Right? One was critical thinking, the other was self-reflection. Mm. And of course, they're related. Mm. You have to think critically about yourself. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's why I like philosophy. I think it, if it, if um, real philosophy. One last question for you. What about the intersection between life and death? When you're, uh, when you're in your deathbed and you know it's inevitable, maybe not in the next hour, but probably in the next day or so. See, for me, we're shopping for, for grave sites and we like the Grave ah, Street Cemetery. Well, this is, and and this, we're, you know, we, we, we planned our monument and we lay down in these uh, available spaces just to take in the view. Uh, you know, we, my wife calls it a grave fitting. And we're going for a fitting. We're going to check out a few other plots. And, uh, you know, maybe the one by Noah Webster or the one by Bart Giamani, you know, at least they'll, they'll, uh, they'll maintain the lawn. And the view wasn't bad either. But um, what about the importance of that? Do you think people need monuments? Because it always, I don't want to be cremated. You know, I don't want the finality of that. I'd like to have some, there'd be some chance that maybe I'll be reintegrated into the organic matrix. Well, you're you're doing what what uh, what journalists do, uh, or what journalists uh, tend to do is they uh, d diverge from. So so it's rather like the Queen 
the queen um you know before the interview the queen being told that but the the queen being assured by the journalist that she would not be asked about what she thinks of Meghan Markle uh and then at the end of the interview being asked well what do you think of Meghan Markle because um uh, when we started out I told you I'd be able to talk about the meaning of life but uh, uh you know <laughs> no I'm just kidding but um, but, but people envisioning their death are, is is there any research on what people's prospects are for the moment of uh passing and coming to terms with that in order to achieve okay say that again can you put that question again well um uh, you ever read tuesdays with maury yeah yeah uh and you know the the takeaway from that book is that it's uh, death is a pro the process of dying is a process of acceptance and coming to terms with your end and and he's he's suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease, so there is this degradation. But yeah, I'm glad you reminded me of that book. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know how how people come to derive comfort in coming to terms with their ultimate demise, and and for me, you know the the finality of okay, I know where I'm going to end up, and it's kind of like uh, well, we're 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 headed out on on a permanent vacation tomorrow, and. Uh, we picked out a hotel that we're familiar with and at least we know where we're going to um so um uh, i mean this might sound simplistic but um i think it's it's a continual battle there's a continual struggle um you know between our sort of survival instincts and um right and and uh, that that tends to make us more selfish think selfishly um and our desire to make the world a better place which is actually connected with our survival right mm -hmm. it's it, 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 in a way it's like enlightened enlightened survival is precisely that learning that that your survival is deeply related to the survival of others, that your happiness is deeply related to the happiness of others. So for me, the trick is, uh, you know, from, from the very beginning um, to, 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 to um, challenge, um, yeah, to, to, to challenge those anxieties, right? and um transcend those anxieties um in in uh, in our um yeah to transcend the, those anxieties through um trying to become more compassionate towards others up to the moment of your last breath yeah and you know so so in other words i know people who who were you know who were still writing their biography uh in their last moments right so that they could oh, christopher hitchens said did you did you have you read yeah yeah story? right yeah he was scribbling on a uh on a dinner tray up to the very end in fact there's a scribble at the very end where he succumbed and and the and the pencil he just drew a line across the page as he fell into yeah so I, I, exactly what is that famous quote don't don't go silently into the night uh, uh what is that quote uh do not go gently into that good night you know gently into the night and i think you know well, what does that mean it's like you're gonna go screaming um <laughs> no i think i think that you know the the if you read between the lines it's like you know you're 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 fighting to be productive and to be and to enrich the world around you um with 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 your last breath you know yeah although i remember one of his final the final quotes was uh i'm not i'm gonna paraphrase it i'm not angry uh that i'm gonna miss the party i'm pissed off that it's gonna go on without me 